Come on, you ready? You believe in God for something good today? Say yes. yes. You got your ears turned on, your heart open and receptive, because what I believe is God's going to change some lives today. I believe that some people are going to realize that in the presence of God, anything is possible, and God wants to do some miracles in our lives. Anybody have some things that you'd like to change in yourself? Say yes. Yes. See, some of y'all should have said yes because you just lied, because everybody's got things that we want to change. Everybody's got something that we need God to change and work on in our lives. I say it all the time. I got issues. You got issues. All God's people has some kind of issues. Things that God wants to continue to perfect and work on in our lives. Some are big, some are small. But today, what I'm believing is that God is going to remind us that he is still a God who does miracles. There never was a day of miracles, just a God of miracles, and that God never changes. And he's still doing it today. I want to use a a story, a very familiar story. You've heard it before. It's a story about a disabled man that Jesus meets. Jesus finds out this guy has been disabled for 38 years. And Jesus changes his life forever. And I want to talk to you today today about how do we get changed? How are we changed? God is still changing people, but we have to know how God does that in our lives. And I just want to talk to you for a few minutes about it because maybe you're here today and you've got some places in your life that needs to be changed. Maybe there's some medical issues that you just wish God would heal you and change that circumstance in in your life. Maybe there's an attitude issue. Maybe it's a hot temper or maybe it's an untrusting spirit and you just wish God would change that because you know it's keeping you from living the abundant life that God wants for you to live. Maybe maybe for you it's overcommitting. Maybe you overcommit. You get nothing of real substance done because you overcommit to do everything and God wants to heal you of that today maybe you're here today and and you overspend God wants to heal you of overspending you can't get out of debt because you spend everything that you get and God wants to to fix that God wants to to heal it maybe you're struggling with an addiction nobody else knows about it I believe today that people are gonna put down their cigarettes People who drank too much are going to put it down today. People who are struggling with addiction in other areas of their life, through the power of God, they're going to put that stuff down today. How many believe God can do it? Say yes. See, here's here's what I want you to do. Today, as you listen to this message, I want you to listen through the lens of hope. I don't want you to listen through the lens of doubt. I don't want you to listen through the lens of fear. I want you to listen through the lens of hope about the power of an encounter with Jesus, because when we meet Jesus, Jesus can change everything. Amen? I want to use this story out of John chapter 5, where Jesus meets a man who'd been crippled for 38 years. The Bible says sometimes later, Jesus, he went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish feasts. He said, now there was there in Jerusalem, near the sheep gate, there was a pool. And in Aramaic, it's called Bethesda which was surrounded by five covered colonnades. Now, this wasn't just any pool. This was a natural pool. This wasn't a man-made pool. This, this natural pond, this natural pool, was surrounded by covered porches that they had made because of the beauty and the aesthetics and the people that it attracted. The Bible says here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind lied there, the lame and the paralyzed. Now, you say, well, why are so many people that are lame and blind and paralyzed? Why did the disabled come here? They came because there is a tradition that said whenever the angel would hover over and the angel would stir the waters, the first one in to the water would receive their healing. So the Bible says one who was there had been an invalid for how long? Say it with me. I mean, no, that's a long time to deal with an issue. God's going to deal with some of our issues today. He says, Jesus saw him lying there and he learned about his condition and how long he had been there. And Jesus asked the man, listen to this. Jesus said, do you want to be well? I mean, at first, it sounds like an insulting question to a man who's been crippled for 38 years. Of course he wants to be well. So why would Jesus ask an obvious question? But Jesus asked the man, do you want to get well? I believe he's asking some here the same question today. Do you want to get well? Is there a physical problem that you've been dealing with for for so long and you you want to get well? Is, is, is Is there a problem... that that you've been dealing with in your marriage for so long and you want your marriage to get well? Is there a problem with with your workplace and with relationships at work and you you just you want to do your part because you want to see it get you want to see it get well? 
And there's some that are here and maybe you've become discouraged because you've prayed about it and you've tried and you've asked God and you know, you've done everything you know to do, but the problem continues to persist. And you just want to get well. You just want God to, to do something for you that you know you can't do for, your, for yourself. And, and this is a powerful, powerful story in this, in this, this chapter of John because here Jesus talks about a question that he has to have the answer to before his healing power can work in our lives. Jesus asked the question not that he didn't know the answer. He just wanted to make sure the man knew the answer before Jesus could bring healing into his life. He said, do you want to be well? And the guy said, yes, sir. But I have nobody to help me into the pool when the water gets stirred. I try to get in, but somebody else always gets in before me. And Jesus said to the man, pick up your mat and walk. And at once, the man was cured, and he picked up his mat, and he walked. Now, here's the first thing I want to say that that passage of Scripture communicates to us, and that is this. One moment in the presence of Jesus can change everything. One moment in the presence of Jesus has the power to change everything everything. How many know a problem persisting for 38 years is a long time? And you know the longer a problem persists, the more problems arise. And I want to just give you three things early on, three things that, that happen when we wait on our problems, when we wait to deal with what needs to be dealt with, when we wait to allow God to heal what needs to be healed. The first thing that happens is, is the longer we wait or the longer we let it persist, the more frustrated we become. How many know the longer you have a problem, the more frustrating that problem becomes? And it's a, it's a powerful re reminder that you, you know, maybe you've done everything you know to do. Maybe you've been to see everybody you know to see. But because the problem is persisting, it won't go away. You are waiting on it to go away. And as you wait, you are becoming more and more and more frustrated. Maybe it's in your marriage and you're like, well, I mean, I went to church. I prayed. I did everything that I knew I was supposed to do. Nothing seems to be helping my marriage. Maybe it's a physical problem and you've been to the doctors and you've prayed, but nothing seems to be helping. And the longer that problem persists, the more frustrated you become, the more discouraged you find yourself becoming. I know in my life when I have to wait to, to, for a problem to be fixed or a, a need to be healed or an issue to change. I know 20 days seems like a long time. 20 months seems like a long time. I know people that have been waiting 20 years on things. How many know that's a long time? And the longer we wait, the longer it persists, the more frustrated we become. Second thing that happens the longer we wait or the longer the problem persists is, is, is the, 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 the less expectation you live with. The longer you wait, the, the longer that problem persists, the less, the, the, the less expectation you have. And wherever you live with a lack of expectation, you know what happens? You begin to make excuses. Remember? I've told you before, when we make room for excuses, we push out room for expectation in our lives. And the longer we live with a persisting problem, the lower our level of expectation and the higher our level of excuses. Maybe you, you've seen this in, you know, in, in, in your life. You, you begin like this man. Jesus said, do you want to be well? What's the first thing this man did? Well, I can't get to the pool. I got nobody to help me. I mean, I can't get there by myself. There's always somebody bigger, always somebody faster, always somebody stronger. I just, boy, I'd love to be well. But I, he didn't even say that. He just began to rattle off excuses because he had been invalid. He had carried his problem for so long, he had lost his expectation. And the same thing happens in our life. You know, you can deal with a bad attitude for so long, you lose your expectation to ever get rid of the bad attitude. Did you know that you can live in a bad marriage so long that you, live, you lose your expectation of a good marriage? You begin to, you begin to negate the idea that you, you even qualify, you even merit, you're even worthy of a good marriage because you begin to tolerate it. And when you begin to tolerate it, your expectation level just gets lower and lower and lower. This man, think about it. After 38 years, certainly, if he had expected something, certainly after 38 years, he could have found somebody to move him a little closer to the pool. He could have, he could have found a way to scooch over, I mean, Inch by inch, he could have crawled or he could have done something to push. He could have shuffled himself on over after 38 years. 
I mean, don't you think after 38 years, you could have found a way to get closer to the pool? But this man had learned to tolerate his disability for so long that he lost his expectation of ever being healed. So he wasn't only living disabled, he was living without hope. Because the longer, listen, the longer we allow a problem to persist, the less expectation we'll live with in our lives. And then there's, a, there's, a, there, there's another one. You know, how about your job? You know, I've seen, people, I've seen people work for 30 years in bad jobs. And all of a sudden the attitude becomes, well, it's a job. Everybody's got to have a job. Well, it's a job. So you work 30 years in a job you don't like? Why? There's only one reason. You've lost your expectation. You don't expect anything better, so you just tolerate what you don't even like. There's some people, you, you, your change needs to be your job. You need to, get, you, listen, you are, you are worthy of the right to get up every morning and enjoy where you go to work. And if you don't like it, you don't have to live with your job as a disability. Just pray, God, change it, open a new door. But you know what? When we begin to tolerate it, we begin, well, there's no other jobs out there. Listen, we're in the most productive job market today in U.S. history. There's never been a day in U.S. history that jobs are more available than today, ever. Ever. Yet we live with this mindset that, well, we just learn to tolerate those things that, I know I'm meddling now. I'll go back to preaching so y'all don't get mad at me, all right? <laughs> but there's a third thing that happens. Not only, not only the, the longer we wait or the longer the problem persists, no, no longer will we become more frustrated. Not only will we lose our expectation, but you know the third thing that'll happen? We'll begin to compensate more. We'll begin to compensate for the problem. We'll just begin to, to compensate for it. There, there's people... There's people, there's people in the room right now. You've become an expert at compensating for your problems, making excuses for your problems. There, there are people who are alcoholics in the room right now, addicted to things in the room right now. You become a functional alcoholic or a functional addict, and you begin to compensate for it because you could, you've, learned, you've learned how to work within your dysfunction. You've learned how to work within your disability. You've learned you can go to work and you can even produce professionally and the people around you don't even know it but you're wrecking your family. You're wrecking the things that are close to you. You're wrecking the things that matter the most to you and you've learned to compensate and live within your disability and the longer you wait, the longer you tolerate an issue, the more you will compensate for your problem. This I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's your marriage again. Maybe, maybe you're living in a marriage, and when I, if I were to walk into your house, I would be there for 15 minutes, and, and, and maybe I would realize you have more of a business partnership than you do a covenant relationship. It wouldn't take me long to figure out you don't have a vision for your home, you don't have a vision for your marriage, you don't have a mission for your marriage, you're not on purpose, for purpose, you're not leading, developing, growing your kids in any direction for their life on purpose, with purpose, there's no intimacy in your home, and you have learned to compensate for it by saying, well, this is just what marriage looks like. No, that is not what marriage looks like. That's what your marriage looks like, and you don't have to settle for it, you don't have to tolerate it. You can change it, but the longer you settle for it, the longer you will compensate for it. Maybe, maybe somewhere in, you know, in, in your life, maybe your issue is, is pornography. And maybe you think, you know, nobody knows about it. Nobody, I'm not hurting anybody. This is just, this is just my outlet. This is just what I do. And you keep tolerating it. Nobody knows. I mean, I just use this for me. This is just, nobody knows. Well, number one, God knows. And that ought to mean something. But number two, you know. It's wrecking your intimacy with the one you love. And if you don't love anybody right now, it will wreck the intimacy when you fall in love or keep you from ever falling in love. And you just compensated for it. Well, it's not hurting anybody. Oh, yeah, it's hurting Everybody, but it's hurting you the most. 
And the Lord would say to you today, the same thing he said to that man who'd been disabled for 38 years, do you want to be well? It's, this, this, this story that, that Jesus tells us, you know, is so great because Jesus just gets right to the bottom line of what he would say to you and me today. He doesn't want our excuses, he wants to see our faith. And so often we want to also offer him excuses because that's what we do when we compensate. When we compensate, we, when, we, when we lose expectation, we begin to blame everybody else. Well, I'm this way because. I became this way when. I've been this way since. My mom and my daddy were this way, so that's the reason I'm this way. And Jesus goes to this guy and he says, listen, I don't want to hear your excuses. I just want to see your faith. Do you want to be well? Because, see, you can't, you, listen, because you can't change what you become willing to tolerate. And too many people have learned to tolerate bad marriages, bad behavior, bad health, bad decision making. And the Holy Spirit would come and he would speak to some of us this morning and he would just remind us, listen, do you want to change? Because remember, you can't change what you learn to tolerate. It's a powerful, powerful story and picture that Jesus, Jesus tell, tells here. For 38 years, this guy has been, has been struggling. And you know what? There's some of us here. We've been struggling for, for years. Some of us have been struggling financially for years. And some have been struggling in our health for years. And some have been struggling in our relationships for years. And some have been struggling mentally for years. And the Holy Spirit would come and just say, do you want to be well? Because, listen, because until your desire to become better becomes bigger than your disability, you'll never be well. Until you, I've said it this way uh, many times, until your want to be better becomes bigger than whatever it is that's limiting you, you'll never be well. Jesus was really saying to this man who'd been sick for 38 years, hey, how big is your want to? How big is your want to? Because until your desire gets bigger than that disability, you'll never be well. So for, for us today in the room, I wonder, is your desire to be better become bigger than the thing that's limiting you from being better? Have you, have you become so fixated on, on what is that you've lost the faith for what could be? And Jesus gives us this powerful, powerful picture in this story by simply asking this man this one little question. And that is, do you want to be well? I talk to people who want to be well financially. I talk to people all the time who are in debt. They need help financially. But they're still playing the lottery. Listen. Newsflash, the lottery ain't your answer to financial freedom. Well, preacher, if I win one time, I'll just tithe. I'll pay this church off. No, you won't, because if you can't tithe on a little, there's no way you're going to tithe on a lot. I mean, I'm just, that's not my notes, but I thought it was good, so I thought I'd say it. I mean, think about it. For some people, I know, I know people, I meet people, they don't drink, they don't smoke, they don't chew, they don't run with folks who do. But you know what their drug of choice is? Spending. They spend, 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 spend because it's a high for them. Well, look, it was all on sale, so I bought it. It was all on sale, so I bought it. Yeah, but you spent $42 trying to save three. That's called an addiction. It's an addiction, and it's no different than a crack addiction, because it's still got a hold of you. And you say, I want to be debt-free, I want to be debt-free, but your actions don't say it. So Jesus says to this man, I don't want to see 
Your excuse is, I don't want to see your faith. Do you want to be well? Because until your desire to be better becomes bigger than what your disability is, you'll never be better. Until your want to becomes bigger than whatever it is that's holding you back, you'll never be better. Is this making sense to anybody today? Because God is a God who never changes and he wants to remind us that he's still in the business of changing other people. But so often, listen, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. If I were to say to you today, hey, what is, um, what is one of your biggest barriers to faith? What is your biggest barrier to growing in your faith? Many of you would say fear. You'd say worry. You'd say doubt. And all of those are really good answers, and and they are all indeed barriers to our faith. But you know what I believe one of the greatest barriers to our faith is? The familiar. See, that was the problem with this man who had been paralyzed for 38 years. He had become so familiar with being disabled that he didn't even have the faith that he could be made well. And sometimes, listen, sometimes we get so comfortable, listen, we get so comfortable living in the uncomfortable because I know it's uncomfortable, but at least I know what it is. And it limits your expectation for seeing what could be because you learn to live with, well, this is just the way it is. My mama was this way. My daddy was this way. I've always been this way. My kids will probably be this way. And you begin to live with this mindset of what is rather than what could be. So Jesus says to this man, do you want to be well? Can you get past what is long enough to see what could be? And we have to be real careful not to become so familiar with our pain, so familiar with our past, so familiar with our problem that we just begin to tolerate it. Because Jesus comes to this man, and you know why Jesus said, do you know why Jesus said, do you want to get well? Because how many know, Jesus already knew he needed to be well. But did you know that you can't fix something that needs to be fixed? You can only fix something that wants to be fixed. Jesus knew he couldn't heal or he couldn't change someone that needed to be changed. He could only change someone that wanted to be changed. So Jesus said, do you want to be well? And he would say that to some of us today. Do you want to be well? Do you you want your marriage to be well? Do you want your mind to be well? To be well? Do you want your health to be well? Do you want your finances to be well? And I think about the power of the, the, the power of the power of people who encounter Jesus. And become courageous enough to enter into the unknown that's uncomfortable. When it would be easier to stay in the known even though it's uncomfortable. Because there's a lot of people who say, I, I, no, I'm not going over there because I don't know. That might, might, might be really uncomfortable. I'd rather just stay. I know this is uncomfortable. I know it's painful. I know my marriage stinks. I know there's no joy in my life. I know I'm never getting ahead financially. I know physically I'm just going to always be sick. But I'd rather be right here uncomfortable where I know where I'm at and take a step into the unknown. And that will always keep you from being changed. When you allow yourself to become so comfortable in the uncomfortable because it's known, you will never ever experience the change that God wants to bring into your life. My dad, I won't tell you the whole story because I've told it to you recently, but I can, me and my brother, we've talked about this so many times. There is no reason 
Me and my brother should have had the dad that we had. There is no reason my dad should have pastored and preached to thousands and thousands and thousands of people. There's no reason my dad should have counseled thousands of young couples into healthy and happy marriage relationships. There's no reason. My dad came from a home of divorce over and over and over, abuse, suicide, rejection after what my dad came through. But you know what happened? One day, one day when my dad was an older teenager, another one of his teenage friends invited him to church. That night at church, he encountered the presence of Jesus. That night, Jesus changed everything that night Jesus said to my dad as a teenage boy Robert do you want to be well that night my dad said yeah I'm willing to step into the unknown because I'm not willing to be comfortable in the uncomfortable unknown I don't know how to be a good husband I don't know how to be a good father I don't know how to be a preacher I don't know how to live right I've not seen it before but I'm willing to step in to what I don't know to get rid of what I do know I don't want to live with anymore and it all happened in the presence of Jesus my wife there's no reason me and my wife should have the relation there's no what reason my wife should have ever trusted another man after the time after time after time the things that she's been through in her life the story there's no reason but one night at a camp in Mentone Alabama about 23 years ago God invaded her spirit washed away all of the memories of her past and told her that she had a new destiny and a new future but she was gonna have to step back into the un uncomfortable, unknown, if she was ever going to experience God's favor and blessing in her life. And I am the recipient today of an amazing wife who chose to step out of a comfortable, uh, uncomfortable known for something that she didn't know because of one encounter with Jesus. And here's what I'd say to you. If he'll do it for my wife, if he'll do it for my dad, he'll do it for you. He's no respecter of persons. He can change it in them. He can change it in you. But you know what he's saying? Do you want to be changed? Listen to me. We don't have to wait till Easter to be reminded. We serve a Savior who is risen and very much alive. He's still doing miracles. Let me, let me just do this. If you're here in this room today and God has ever healed your body, stand up on your feet. If you're here today and God's ever healed your marriage, stand up on your feet. If you're here today and God's ever healed your mind from depression or oppression, stand up on your feet. If you're here today and God's ever healed you of an addiction, you once were addicted, but you, you ain't anymore. Stand up on your feet. Now look around the room. Look around the room. <laughs> Just give Jesus a big hand, will you? Tell him, tell him thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet because I want all you folks who aren't standing to look around the room. And here's what I want to tell you. Jesus, God, your Father, your Creator, the one who knows you, made you, knows you best, He is no respecter of persons. And if He'll do it for all of us, He'll do it for you. Yeah. Now, there's some of you who, there's some of you who you, you're standing right now. You're standing right now. And God, God's healed your body, but now you need him to heal your man at marriage. God's healed your marriage, but now you need him to heal an addiction. God's healed your addiction, but now you need God to heal an attitude. God's healed your attitude, but now you need God to heal your finances. Listen, if God did it once, God will do it again. You just have to trust him. And when he says, do you want to be well, you stand up, you pick up your mat, and you walk well. That's the beauty of the God we serve. Thank you. You can be seated and thank you for helping me preach. <laughs> Isn't it good news to know that that God is still God? Yeah. That God is still working and he's still moving and, he, and he's still doing miracles today. This room, you know what you just saw? A room full of witnesses. You just saw a room full of testimonies. And you know what? Nobody in the room deserved anything they got. None of us. You know, God, God doesn't bring miracles because we're good. God does miracles because He's good. And God doesn't do miracles so that we can look good. God does miracles so that He can look good through us. God doesn't do miracles for our glory. He does miracles for his glory. And when God knows that he can trust you with a miracle, God will continue to do miracles. 
You know what I believe? I believe the one who the pain persisted or the hurt persisted or the sin persisted or the sickness persisted or whatever it is persisted for so long when they get their miracle, I believe they're going to be the greatest witness of all. Because they'll stand up with the loudest voice. That, boy, that old boy with 38 years, boy, I'd like to hear him preach. Wouldn't you like to hear his testimony? After 38 years of sitting by a pool, lame, and all of a sudden, Jesus just says, Hey, do you, is your desire to get better bigger than your desire to live paralyzed? Powerful, powerful story. But you know, really three interesting things that happened in that story that I don't, we don't think about very often, and that is number, number one, that sick guy, he didn't even ask Jesus to heal him. Do you notice that? He didn't even ask Jesus to heal him. Which is, which is one of the gazillion reasons it's important for you and I to get into the presence of God every day. It is so important for when we wake up in the morning and we say, Lord... This is your day, not my day. I'm not living for me. I'm living for you. I'm going to do everything I can to honor you and to bless other people in your name. God, I'm, this is not my day. This is your day. Use me in whatever way you see fit. You know why? Because what you've just done is you've moved into the presence of God. And when you move into the presence of God, you become more like... Did you know that you become like whatever you get close to? Did you know that? You become like whatever you get close to. The closer you get to God, the more like God you become. And when you get closer and closer, in the, pre the reason you get in the presence of Jesus every day is Jesus will begin doing things in you that you didn't even ask him to do for you. Did you know that? I mean, look at this guy. He never asked Jesus to heal him. He just got in the presence of Jesus and Jesus healed him. Did you know... <coughs> <laughs> Y'all pray with me. I'm three weeks and I'm almost over this whole thing. Did you know that this, this old boy, he never begged Jesus for anything. You know you don't have to beg God for anything. You ever heard somebody pray, oh, Lord, please, please. Listen, he heard you the first time. God is not moved by begging people. God is moved by faithful people. And when you ask him, He's heard you. You don't have, listen, you don't have to say, God, heal my marriage. God, heal my marriage. The next day, God, heal my marriage. The next week, God, heal my marriage. God heard you the first time you act. You know what God wants you to do? Pick up your mat and walk. You know what that means? You do your part. Jesus, Jesus did everything he could do, but then he said to that man, I've done everything I can do, but now you have to do what only you can do. You know, there's some things that only you can do. You know that, right? I'd like to preach on marriage right here for just about an hour. But, but I just want to... Uh, remind you that in this story, like your story, Jesus did something for the man that the man didn't even ask Jesus to do simply because he was close to Jesus. There are miracles, listen, there are miracles Jesus will bring into your life, miracles that you didn't even know you needed that he gave you just because you got closer to Jesus. Jesus will bring healing and forgiveness in your heart in places you didn't even know were sick because you're close to Jesus. Jesus will, Jesus will help you forgive someone that hurt you when you didn't even know you didn't even know how deeply they hurt you simply because you were close enough to Jesus to be a little bit more like Jesus. This man got healed not because of begging, but because of proximity. In the presence of Jesus, change th things change. Second thing that's really interesting here is this man didn't do anything to deserve it or to earn it. You ever thought about that? You can't, did you know you can't work your way to healing? You can't work your way to a miracle? You'll never be good enough for God to be good to you. God's good to you not because you're good, but because he's good. Yeah. 
the third thing that happened in this story that, that is really interesting is um, so, so often it happens in our story this way and that is God didn't do it the way we think he should do it. God, God didn't heal this man the way that this man thought he would be healed. How did this man think he would get healed? Get in the pool. If somebody can just get me in that pool first, I'll be healed. And so often we think, I got to get healed this way. I got to get healed that way. This person's got to pray. That person's got to pray. I got to go here. I got to go there. I've got to do. Listen, God will do things in ways that we never thought he would do them. You got to know, you got to know that the reason we get into the presence of God is because God does things when we're in his presence. God doesn't do them because we're good or because we behave or because we earn it. Listen, when you get in the presence of God, you want to behave. A lot of people try to behave. That's what legalism is. I don't want to get too close to God, but I want to be good. No. Being good will never get you close to God. Being close to God will help you be good. God will do things in your life in ways that you never, ever thought he would do them. And Jesus says to this man what he says to some of us today, and that is simply this. Do you want to be well? Do you want to be well? Okay, show me your faith, not your excuses. Jesus said, all right, pick up your mat and walk. You know why this old boy didn't walk? He didn't walk for 38 years because he had gotten used to living with the mentality that if he stood up, those two legs he still had were not strong enough to support him. Do you know why so many of us don't walk away from our problems? Because we don't think the legs we stand on can support the change that it's going to require in us. So we just stay disabled. We learn to live limp. Because we don't think we have the strong enough support system to walk in healing. And Jesus says to this man, I've done everything I can do. Now you've got to do what you can do. And that is, you've got to get up on those two lame legs that you've gotten used to believing will not support you and walk in faith. And there's some people that are here today, and I just believe that even, even now the Holy Spirit's tapping, tapping on your heart, tapping on your spirit. Maybe shining the spotlight of the Holy Spirit into places of your life that you've learned to tolerate. You've begun to compensate for. You've grown more and more frustrated, but you've learned to live without expectation. You've began to believe that what is, is. And what could be never will be. And the Holy Spirit gives us this message today to interrupt bad thinking. And say to you, do you, do you really, really want to be well? Is your desire to overcome a less than healthy marriage, a less than healthy financial position, a less than healthy mental state, a less than healthy physical state? Is your desire to overcome a less than healthy, healthy job situation greater than your desire to live disabled another day? Jesus would say the same thing to you and to me that he said to that paralyzed man that day hey, that mat that you were carried in on stand up fold it up and carry it out because that thing that's carried you for so long now you'll carry it 
I'm going to very quickly ask for all of our, stand with me if you will. I'm going to ask our prayer team, altar workers, very quickly to come and stand in the altar. Because I, I believe that there are people that are here today that the Holy Spirit is, is talking to, is tapping on your, on your heart. You spread out across, all the way across the front. We're going to need you. Holy Spirit's about to do something significant here in the room. I'm going to give you an opportunity to pick up your mat and walk. If you're here today and the Holy Spirit's tapping on your heart and the Holy Spirit would say to you, you don't have to live this way anymore. Pick up your mat, walk. Walk out of this less than healthy marriage. Walk away from a spirit of poverty and debt. Walk away from bad health. Walk away from depression. Walk away from addiction. The only way you or I ever get changed is when our desire to be changed becomes greater than the thing that's holding us down. See, because what you have to begin to believe is you are, you maybe you have been knocked down. But I can tell you this, you've not been knocked out. And the Holy Spirit wants to pick you up from when you've been knocked down. And if that's you, our team will be out here and ready to sing for us in just a moment. But I want you just to come, find one of these people to pray with, and let's allow God to begin the healing process in your life because you don't have to stay that way anymore. This is your time to come. Don't wait. Don't look around. Don't see what anybody else is doing. You just come and do what God calls you to do. In Jesus' name.